Nice seeing you, everyone. Uh, finally, a live meetup. I've been in, a, well, for two years only, the virtual ones. Uh, I'm Gerben Oostra. I'm from the Netherlands, indeed. And today, my goal is to show how causal inference can be made easy using inverse propensity weighting. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows where it is, but well, I got this picture from Wikipedia. So you got Europe and the small, tiny country in green. That's the Netherlands. Uh, I joined Vianai Systems, which actually is in Israel, here at Tel Aviv. Um, and I usually, of course, work from home, from Haarlem. Uh, but as I say, you might think, like, why did I join a company all the way in uh, Israel? Um, that's because my main interests are uh, causal inference, contextual bandits, and machine learning engineering in general. And Vianai allows me to work on all those topics. And also the last point, uh, trail running. Uh, between the Zoom calls, uh, I now, after two years, are still doing while everyone is going to the office. I can uh, get some fresh air uh, in the dunes near Haarlem. Um, a short word about uh, Vainai. We're um, a company building the world's first decision optimization platform to uh, reliably prescribe, validate, and execute actions that optimize business outcomes. It's a mouthful. Uh, in short, um, we're trying to build a platform uh, for businesses, a self-service platform, in which they can uh, well self-serve causal inference platform, which truly optimizes outcome <clears throat> outcome. So we're not just doing machine learning in general. We're trying to make impact on uh, in the company. Um, yeah, and as being uh, a small company, we're still growing. So you might uh, be interested or know someone. Uh, please leave me a message. Uh, well. The topic of this talk is causal inference and how to solve it. So I'll first give a short introduction why causal inference is worth solving and then how I, yeah, inverse perpetuating actually is one of the solutions to it. Um, yeah, as an introduction, if we look back at the uh, timeline of uh, analytics we've done, uh, initially most analytics was done by creating dashboards, making charts, plots, uh, showed it to the business. Uh, using correlation or using statistics to actually get some numbers out of it. And the question we're answering is uh, what happened in the past? We're just looking backwards, explaining what happened. Then machine learning came along. Um, we're looking at, for example, well, nice uh, pictures of dogs and cats. You get a picture, you get a label. You can learn what the label is given the picture. What we're then actually doing is we're looking at correlations. There's some correlation between the picture and the label. Uh, we put uh, a paper on the label, and then we can predict what goes on, uh, what's behind the paper. Uh, what we're seeing now in the data science community is that we're moving towards uh, prescriptive analytics. The idea is that we're not just looking at correlations, we're actually going to look at the system, how a system behaves, which events and actions cause other events and actions, and then um, using causal inference, we can answer a different question. We're not uh, answering the question like, uh, given this information, what is the other information? I don't know yet. We're asking which action should I take? What should I do differently from what I'm doing now to get a better result? To, to give, a, uh, give you a little bit more intuition about what's the difference, uh, I drew here some example, uh, put here some examples. For example, the predictive approach on uh, getting a new customer, like uh, acquisition, would be to answer the question, how likely is this customer, well, this prospect becoming a customer? But the prescriptive uh, approach will be to say, would it help if I call this person? Or would it help if I send him an email or disc give him a discount? Uh, regarding product engagements, will this user become a monthly active user? Uh, will, yeah, will he become a monthly active user? Or what can I do uh, to improve the product engagement? Sending, sending an email, does it improve his engagement? Uh, related to churn, uh, a lot of uh, companies are trying to predict the churn, like how likely is this person going to churn, but that's, that's a pre uh, predictive uh, approach. The prescriptive approach we need to say which, which people, uh, which customers should actually call to prevent them from churning. Yeah, so in short, uh, of course, now I think you're getting the guess with the difference between predictive and prescriptive. Uh, in short, it is with, with predictive approach, you keep the system uh, like you're, yeah, your full system, like your company, how it operates, you keep it the same. And then you're going to predict what will happen if you continue operating like this. The idea of prescriptive approach is that you're going to change some things in the system, 
which will cause the correlations actually to change, and then you get different outputs, different outcome, and one you preferably want to have. Um, yeah, so the goal of causal inference is to predict the effect of an action given a known context, and in short, you can answer questions like, what if I do well, X, what will happen, and why will it happen? Or if you're looking at uh, old data, what if I had done something else in the past, would I have got another result now? Um, there are different techniques to solve this, and the one I will cover today is inverse propensity weighting. Um, but first, to explain like why inverse propensity weighting actually solves, uh, well, is a solution to causal inference, I need to explain what actually is difficult about causal inference. Um, so what I've drawn here is a causal graph, uh, the most simple one actually. <laughs> so you got a user with some features, we call them of course X, and there's some results, the churn rate, the, the churn, the churning yes or no, uh, product, en uh, product engagement, whatever you want. And we also have got uh, so-called treatment, the action we do, we sending emails, giving and discounts, all those kind of things. And both of course influence results. Um, I already mentioned, uh, if we have a system like a company operating, there are all kinds of correlations in the system. And then, uh, the thing is, if we're looking at the data, if you collect a lot of features and labels, the only thing you can see are actually the correlations. And with those correlations, you can build with whatever models, maybe deep learning, you can build really predictive models. So you get correlation does give you predictive power. However, uh, we're interested in this specific link. We're not interested in this one. We want to know like what what is the effect of a treatment on the result, and to do that we need a uh, so-called uh, cause. Uh, yeah, that's a prescriptive power, and that we need a causal link, the causation instead of the correlation. And the way I've drawn this causal graph, uh, the correlation between the treatment and the result is actually equal to this single arrow, which is also the causal link. So this this case, correlation is equal to uh, causation. Yeah. However, in practice, this graph usually isn't the correct graph. Um, which, pe which people are you giving a discount? Which people are you calling? Usually there's some business process, some uh, marketing campaign, some other, yeah, some other rule-based system determining which users will get certain treatments. And also the whole idea of this cause inference is that we make a model which will prescribe actions. If we're gonna use that model in production, it will create, it will specify which treatments to do based on the features. So our future data set will, actually, will always have a dependency, actually a causal link between features and treatments. In this graph, the correlation we observe in the data between the treatment and result is not anymore equal to the causal link between the two. That's because there's also a correlation between treatment and, and the features and a correlation between the features and the results. So there are two, two, correlated, there are two correlation paths, that so-called backdoor, and then we're only interested in this single one. Um, if you look at this system, you could still make a really predictive model. However, that predictive model doesn't per se uh, become is a good prescriptive model. So now we're going to solve this, uh, this case. So there are two general approaches or situations you can solve it in. Uh, one, one approach is to start a so-called random control trial, where you run an experiment for a limited time, where you assign the treatments completely random. What you basically do, in short, is you re remove the link between the features and the treatments. And then uh, the correlation between treatment and result is again the causal link, and you can use any machine learning to learn the effect. Uh, it's simple, straightforward, um, and a uh, correlation again, causation. The only issue is you're running, you're only learning during the experiment. You're throwing away all the data before your experiment, and you won't use or can't use any data after experiments. So of course the goal is in using as much as possible, much of the data you have. And yeah, we all want to do big data, right? So you just use all the data we have and learn from that. So the, the a better or in more in, yeah, maybe better, better uh, more interesting problem to solve is to find out how we can remove the bias uh, created by this correlation, by this backdoor correlation <coughs> and still be able to predict this causal link. Um, yeah, so uh, two advantages. So one, if you're gonna use all data, and another advantage is that we also will be able to use future data, which is really nice because then every week or month or year, we can retrain the model and actually learn from the actions we took. 
Uh, there are two, well, two downsides. Is one is that you actually need to know all these uh, so-called confounders. These features in the causal inference uh, literature uh, are called confounders. You need to know them. If you've got, if you don't know them, you can't correct for them, which is quite tricky. And also another, well, risk or downside is is that your system might be too deterministic. If, for example, uh, in your customer acquisition, you always call all people be, uh, above 50 years, and you always email all persons below 50 years. There's no way your model can learn what an email does for a 50 plus a person and what a call will do for a below 50 person. It never happens, so there's no way, there's no information about it. So you need to have some variability, so, some randomization in your data, um, but it doesn't have to be like here, completely random. The general approach in uh, getting so-called unbiased predictions uh, using ob observational data is first to include all your confounders. Um, sometimes you're actually the system you're trying to model is quite easy or your uh, model is really good. And then you can have like a perfect model. If it is able to predict all the nuances, all the small changes you see, then actually you're already done. Um, however, usually, well, mostly you have got errors because not all real life systems are that easy to model. And then um, how you can imagine it is that those errors are mainly minimized for the, uh, the policy which your model, which your company currently has. So today we're gonna use inverse frequency weighting to ensure that these errors are um, how do I say, evenly distributed between your old policy and any arbitrary new policy. You can think like, if, if I would keep the system the same, you have the way you operate, the people you send an email, then it's, you, just, you can have quite a good uh, predictive power. Uh, but what we want to do is take different actions. We want, my, we want to send an email to other people than we're currently doing to make, make our policy better. Uh, yeah. yeah, of course, yeah, of course, better. <laughs> So the question is, if you include your confounders, uh, does it actually remove the bias uh, enough? Uh, and does it really remove the backdoor? No, if you include them, you don't remove yeah. the backdoor. Yeah. The backdoor okay. is open and- It's still there. It's there. And then yeah. whatever your model gives you it could be bad results. Like the correlation can be, spur can be spurious. Yeah, so, um, yes, okay. Let me repeat the question first. <laughs> <laughs> so if you add uh, the confounders, you can you still have the back door in your causal graph, so you can still have wrong predictions on your effect. And um, what I see that if you include the confounders, it's the same as okay, I've got a toy, it's not stratification, but it's uh, um, standardization. I keep <laughs> mixing two. What you kind of do is you let your model uh, standardize, yeah, do standard, apply standardization, which is different technique. So kind of per bin of your features, like per area of your feature space, you can, your model can learn the mean, uh, the mean outcome for the treated and the mean outcome for the non-treated and have a non-biased group within that bin, like within a small area. And if it is able to do that for all your areas, uh, then you will have really low error, like your model is like, practically accurate. And then it works, however, usually, uh, when you just throw in the confounders, your model isn't able to do that standardization completely correct. And then you will have errors, and those errors, um, they ensure your model tries to reduce the average error. And the average error is always biased towards your current policy, because that happens the most. So you're saying if, if I include the, con uh, the confounders, yeah. then... Uh, I can use the, the accuracy of my model to judge whether the backdoor hurt me or not? Yeah, so, so if your model is like practically perfect, yeah. then you're already done. But I never, I, at least, I usually don't have a perfect model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so then the, what, the errors you have, those will, you uh, won't be sure if the, you'll see some errors, so you think, okay, I've got a certain predictive error on the outcome. Um, what actually those errors are the, the, the errors you can expect if you would run the current policy because it minimizes the current policy, uh, is biased towards the current policy. But if you would do a different action, 
the expected error on that new action might be higher than the error you see in your test set. That's kind of the... <laughs> okay. So then inverse branch weighting may... Um, yeah, we'll ensure that the errors are random, both across uh, current policy and uh, alternative policies. And actually, it's quite, a, it's quite a simple technique. So what we do with inverse propensity weighting is we create a propensity model. So we create a, a propensity model, which given the features, learns what the likelihood of a treatment is. Um, as an example, like, you can imagine that we've got a certain features, uh, and for every range of features, like, Okay, of course it's multidimensional, but I assume it's like single dimensional. For some values, you prefer one treatment over the other, and for other, other uh, values, we, it's the other way around. What we now actually do is we create a model uh, which will learn this curve, uh, but then of course multidimensional uh, on your data set. And the approach of inverse propensity weighting is, is then to create, uh, to predict the propensity of the treatment you act your sample and your data ex data set actually got. So you're looking at your historical data. Uh, some users got a certain treatment. You predict the propensity that it got that uh, the likelihood of getting that treatment. Now we're going to create sample weights for our for the model we want to learn. And the sample weight is equal to one divided by that same propensity. If you think if you look like uh, if you're thinking about a feature space and at some Places in the feature space, uh, treatment one is more likely, in other spaces, treatment two is more likely. And now we're going to re weight our data set. So we got these, uh, maybe a ratio of 10 to 1 of feature of treatment one uh, to two. We're going to weight them uh, inversely. So one is weighted down, down weighted by 10, and the other one is uh, down weighted by one. So actually, the likelihood within small sub areas will be the same. It's quite, yeah. To verbally describe it is quite difficult, <laughs> but it's kind of like if you have this slope and you divide or you multiply the yeah, uh, its propensity, but think of it like a frequency. If you multiply by the weight, which also kind of artificially creates a pseudo data set with different frequencies, you will get uh, a uniform of all treatments across the full feature space. And then um, there's no, the idea is that this had gives you no bias anymore, because there is no relationship anymore between features and your, in our new, uh, between our features and a treatment in our new pseudo data set. So we're creating a pseudo data set by reweighting such that there's no dependency anymore from feature to treatment. So the, the cookbook or recipe in short is, we train a propensity model, we predict the propensity for all observed treatments, and then we can train an outcome model using uh, typical machine learning approaches However, we uh, weight our samples by the inverse propensity we got from the previous step. Well, then I can uh, tell you this, and you might believe me or not, but the question, of course, is does it work? So, as a test case, I created a bias data set. So, we got my, our calls a graph again. Um, I created a simple relationship between features and results, which is uh, linear. Um, I created an uh, interesting treatment effect being this V-shape. And I also created a uh, certain selection by well, treatment selection between having influence from features to treatments being this uh, sigmoid. So it's the, the y-axis is the probability of getting a treatment. If you combine this and create some uh, samples, uh, it looks like this. So it's still uh, one-dimensional. The blue dots are the non-treated and the orange ones are the treated. So you see it's like kind of the, you see the V as a small delta on top of the non-treated values. Uh, what we're now gonna do is like I choose a model, which is this linear model, uh, and we're gonna use as loss function of root mean square error, because it's a regression and we want to try to fit this. Um, you already see that the, the treatment has a constant in, uh, in front of it. So we already know it won't be able to uh, represent the outcome perfectly. Of course, you can make a more complex model, but the idea is whatever system there is in real life, your model might not be complex enough to really represent it. So I now took a really simple data set and then ensured that my model is, well, reasonably well equipped to predict the outcome, but it's not fully, uh, fully capable of doing so. And then our effects, like the effect of treatment, is just uh, 
I would say, if, if, we have, if we have trained a model, we can just create two predictions. One with the treatment variable being uh, true and one with treatment variable being false and subtract the two from each other. And so, yeah, because both the, both the feature set, both the feature and the treatment are in the linear, in linear regression. And we just subtract the two and then we get our uh, treatment effect. And this approach, well, we're using a single model to learn, so it's also known as the S-learner. If we train this model, um, it will not, will never be able to represent, of course, the V-shape. But so, it's, it, it's just not capable of doing it. But with a room, root mean square error loss function, what we expect is to see is that it will, act, uh, it will predict the mean, like the average treatment effect. Because root mean square error optimizes the, the mean, so we would expect it to also predict like the mean treatment effect across the full feature space. Um, however, from the, the, the average of this V value is around here, while our model's estimate is like there, is, is at this space. And this bias is due to the uh, confounders. So following the cookbook, we're gonna create a propensity model. Um, and then ideally your propensity model is again, almost 100% perfect, but usually it isn't. So I deliberately made my propensity model a bit too uh, biased. Um, the blue dots is the tr ground truth of the propensity of the, of the likelihood of getting a treatment, and the orange one is what the model says. Uh, of course, in practice, you don't have the blue line, so you don't know <laughs> how well that fits. But what you can do is you can make this calibration plot, where you, where you, uh, you predict all the propensities, you take the bin, for example, around uh, 10%, you just take all samples within the 10% bin, and what you expect to see is 10% positives within that bin. And you just create a plot of that. And then you see that for the lower bins, it's, uh, it uh, overestimates the value, and for the higher bins, it underestimates it. So then you can just adjust it by a small, uh, yeah, removing the bias by correcting, uh, correcting those bins. And then you can do, the, for example, cross file predict, and then you get <laughs> the actual, uh, actual propensities. So then the propensities are actually true probabilities. And then if you again create a calibration plot, uh, it's uh, much better. And scikit-learn has just standard the calibration functions to be able to do this. And also the plots. Um, well then, we've got our propensities. Next step, divide one, divide, one divided propensity and we got our weights. And we see our next problem. If we divide something uh, one by something which is quite small, we'll on the limit go to infinity. So if you've got a really rare, rare case in your data set, um, it will get infinite weight and your whole model will just learn that single point. That's not really, that. Yeah, we can all see that <laughs> that will not work out. There are two approaches. One is to clip the value. So you say, well, any value above 0.95 or below 0.05, we just set it to that, uh, that boundary. Another approach is that you say, well, actually, uh, these extreme propensities tell me that in these areas of feature space, I don't have enough, uh, yeah, no, not enough noise, no, not enough randomization. So actually, my model probably isn't really good in predicting what happens there. I might need uh, to do some, uh, actually still do an experiment for this area. I just throw them out of my uh, data set for now. So that will mean setting the weight to zero. Uh, let's go back. So if, uh, if we reweight our samples with the inverse pencil weights, uh, we just create it, and then we train the same linear model. We actually get the green dots, and it's nice, perfect on top of the true average treatment effect. So it shows, at least in this case, uh, it really works. Um, well, the, the steps have been uh, expanded a bit. So we got train the propensity model, calibrate them, predict the propensity for observed treatments, then do some clipping mechanism, and only then, step five, we can train the outcome model uh, on inverse propensity weighted samples. Uh, some final remarks is, well, at least I hope you can take this, uh, can take this home, is if you have really good, if you have some qual uh, predictive quality on your outcome, it doesn't per se mean you also have prescriptive power because of the bias. Uh, the reason is, if you train your model on, uh, well, biased, uh, data train set, your validation and test set are also biased. So it actually performed really well on other biased systems. If you're gonna put your prescription in production, you're gonna 
create different samples with different distributions, and then suddenly you see bigger errors. Next point is you always need some randomization. If it's too deterministic, you can't learn anything. Uh, I think I've repeated that already a few times. And another thing is that your prevention model actually doesn't need to be uh, perfect. Mainly, the reason to have the prevention model mainly is to represent those confounders. So finding extra features which help you predict a better propensity actually can make actually removes the efficiency of the Prensi model. The whole idea is that it should focus on the confounding variables. Uh, of course, this is only a short talk, and uh, I, can, I, can, I can only cover a little bit of the material. So actually, uh, there are two blog posts I've written about this topic. One is understanding inverse Prensi weighting, another is preventing churn like a bandit. Of course, I recommend those. Uh, <laughs> Next to that, there are two books I really recommend. One is support the Book of Y from Julio Pearl, which is more on causal inference in general. Another one you might have not heard of is causal inference what if, which is just an online open source book, which really explains you how all techniques work, uh, including standardization, stratification, inverse pensy weighting, and many more. And for a quick explanation of al many algorithms, EconML has done a, quite a good job of explaining, uh, actually they implement a lot of algorithms and also have done a really good job of writing them down, how they work, and actually why they work. Um, and here, yeah. So, this was it. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah of course. Uh, this is an old problem of some sort of selection bias, which statisticians deal many, and econometricians deal a lot. They can yeah. win a Nobel Prize on solving this assumption yeah. based on strong parametric assumptions. Uh, Jack Mansky proved that in cases of uh, sample selection biases, there is no magic word if you don't have information in your data <laughs> to estimate, yeah. not inverse propensity, not anything will help you to estimate the real treatment effect. And this is an issue which a connotation uh, engage with it a lot. It's not that you have a magic Solution. Uh, uh, then I would have gotten no, I would have got a Nobel Prize. Then, I think. then I would have got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> or at least some, the one uh, the I've been Jack doing. Mansky, yeah. uh, he, he, I know him. He's a professor. Uh, every year, many uh, also refer to Nobel Prize. But Josh Engrist in France win Nobel Prize this exactly on those problems. And yeah. it proves that if you don't have any information, sample selection bias, there is only a very high bounds to the probability, real probability of response if you use your models on other population which don't distribute as the big data that you have. I give you an example, yeah. credit scoring. I developed yeah. once a model of credit scoring. The most uh, significant variable was unemployment. And the model said there are the best risks. Yeah? Okay. So this is bias, of course. Yeah, no, Why yeah. is it bias? Because the credit card company didn't give, give credit to bad, to bad unemployees, but only if they have another information which we don't see in the data. Yeah. So how yeah. is your model can predict from no data that unemployment is a bad for credit? Yeah. That's a, an example yeah. of okay, I'll try to summarize it. <laughs> I'll try to summarize your question. Okay. <laughs> how, how can you predict this uh, if your data doesn't actually show the information? Yeah, yeah. of course you can't. And I, I think the summary is in my uh, point of it's not be, it shouldn't be too deterministic. If your credit scoring uh, system, of your, yeah, the, credit, the credit company never gave loans to unemployed people, there's no way to know for which unemployed people uh, yes. a good credit would or wouldn't work. So then you need, of course, you need to run some experiments if you want to learn it, yes. well, if it's worth the price. No, FICO and others use your method on, on, the, on the st classical statistics. Uh, they call it augmentation, credit scoring. But they, again, doesn't solve the problem of no information. No, no, no the, uh, I totally agree. If you don't have any information, your model can't learn it. But what I do see a trend is that uh, typically in econometrics and statisticians um, use certain models to train uh, to actually predict effects. And usually there were like um, yes, specific parameterized models. 
And we also see in the data science community, it's all like just throw in as big as possible neural network, throw in a many amount of feature generation and just make it work. So the power of machine learning allows you to express a lot of uh, dependencies. However, the bias still exists. And of course you need information. Uh, and what I like from my first pencil waiting, and that's it's a way to bring the power of deep learning and all other techniques we have, uh, cut boost, whatever, into the more uh, classical area of uh, more linear regressions and then uh, those assumptions. This is the okay. machine learning. So so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I also want to give someone else an opportunity. Maybe we can uh, dis continue discussion over a beer or uh, something else. Are there more questions? Yeah. Are there any statistical tests? I mean, if you're taking the frequencies of, for example, sorry, patients. <laughs> Uh, are, are there any statistical tests for uh, how good is my uh, modeling? How, what is my, uh, how good are my prescriptions? Um, uh, it, it's quite difficult. I, I, what I think you were aiming at, like if you created your model like this, how do you know uh, if it actually works? So then um, you come in the area of uh, so-called offline policy evaluation. So you would. We just created a, un, we tried to create an unbiased predictor of who are given treatment. So we know this treatment will have a positive effect or not. And then based on that, we'll give the treatment yes or no. But if you have a test set, you can actually look at those uh, test data and see for every row, would I have given the same treatment as the person actually got? And if I didn't, well, then I wouldn't have seen this in my uh, experiment because I wouldn't treat this person. So I will not see this sample like it occurred. Uh, see, okay, if I have a person in my test set who got treatment A and my policy says I should give them treatment B, um, in, if I would run my, my policy in, in production, I wouldn't see this record because he got the wrong treatment. So I can throw it out. And then you go along, like go through your whole test set like this. So you throw out all samples which don't agree with your uh, policy. It's called the agreement set. And then you get an estimate on, uh, it's like one estimate on your policy uh, quality. So you can actually see if I would have run an, uh, this, product, this policy production, I, this is kind of the results I would have got, gotten. It is one caveat is that, of course, the, the, the size, like the number of records we actually match your new policy depends on your previous policy. So we actually do something which uh, there's a called important sampling, which is kind of the same as being first pension waiting, but it's uh, something to Google, I think. And <laughs> but th there are some ways, and then you can do th also mention like a certainty. So then there are ways like bootstrapping to get, get some sense. But of course, the only true, uh, yeah, true, true way to find out if it really works is put it in a production and maybe do like a B testing, comparing previous policy and your new policy. But at least you have got like an initial guess of what your policy would perform probably, and then you can verify it. You, I hope it then. You, you, you said earlier that there are two approaches, the RCT and the randomized yeah. and, and observational. So yeah. the randomized is always very wasteful because you can use your previous experience, so you can uh, improve it in the future and so on. Yeah. But, but, but suppose you have a very big, uh, big data. Uh, a lot of potential for not clean, not a standard clinical trial like in medicine, but maybe you have a big company, lots of customers, lots of uh, uh, treatments you can offer. So, could you somehow compare them to uh, quantitatively, suppose, uh, if you don't mind, please? Uh, um, the, you could. You could uh, do both. So if you have done already like a random experiment, then you can see if it aligns a bit with what you see when you use all observational data to get some more confidence before you put your new newly trained IPW model into production. Um, I, but there's always a risk that reality is different from what you've saw, seen. And it also depends on how much your new policy is different from your existing policy. Uh, so I would recommend like doing all these comparisons as much as possible, like bootstrapping to get some idea of the confidence, uh, how uh, stable is your model actually, if, if some, if you, is the performance you get just based on the random test, or random train set you selected, and then, yeah, do an experiment, but then not do a random experiment, but do an experiment with your new policy, which you think is better. So you already have some confidence in it being better, and then you can slowly 
then move more towards your new policy. I think we're done with questions. Thank you.